We are so super duper excited to be here uh, and to lead this really intentional discussion. Um, and so we hope that you will engage with us engaging conversation. I would love to see how folks are doing today. If you could tell us in the chat, how are you feeling today? Let us know in the chat how you're feeling. We were just in here talking about how the weather is so nice in some of the places where we're located and how that's helpful. <laughs> All right. Good morning, Rhonda. We're going to be doing a lot of engagement and participation and chatting in the chat. So I would love to see folks begin to exercise that and uh, let us know in the chat how you're feeling today. Are there folks with us today? Can you hear me? Amazing, excited for warmer weather, optimistic, happy to see some sunshine, hoping for a great session, looking for the presentation, loving the sun, looking for the discussion. Me too, me too. Good morning, Audrey. So I remind folk, um, you know, oh, uh, actually, we wanted to do a quick check in here. Uh, I was going to say for folks who had been in the session before, just so that you know, you can always send things to me privately. And if you send something to me privately, I'll make sure you're included in the conversation. But just to kind of gauge um, how many folks were in the previous webinar, the role of transformation leadership and creating a culture of change, were you here for that session? So we know how much we should recap. All right, we have about half of the folk have responded. If you could let us know, so we'll know what direction to take. Okay. So about 60% of folks responded. 60% of folks were not uh, at the role of transformational leadership talk and about 40% were. So a little bit of background context about me, about um, Livia, and just to give a little bit of context to the session today, we, are, we really enjoy having these conversations. The work that we've been doing has been looking at equity, understanding equity, um, and what that looks like in practice and moving from performative diversification efforts and initiatives to what does sustainable and concretized change look like? What does culture shift look like within organizations to ensure equity and inclusion? And so I have been teaching online um, for many, many years now, probably close to a decade or so. We're very good at engaging with the chat and communicating. So it's not going to distract us at all. They're welcome to chime in, participate, and engage throughout the chat for the entirety of the discussion, as well as if there's anything that you want to share or something you want to bring into the space that you're not feeling completely comfortable to do, um, you can always send it to me privately, and I will be sure to read your comment without including your name. And so one of the things we talked about in the last session, or how do we lay the framework, the groundwork rather, to have these equity conversations? And what are some of the best practices we have utilized um, in continually having um, the, uh, these, these types of conversations? And so this is a list of our equity best conversations and best practices. So we're going to review them really quickly and to talk about them. And as I review them and we talk about them, I'm just going to ask folks to share which ones stand out to you, which ones do you particularly like. If you were here for the previous session, I would like for you to share which one have you, you know, seen an opportunity to use um, since our last conversation. So if y'all could think about that as I read through, that would be amazing. The first one is to expect a lack of closure. This is journey. The process of inequities has been compounded and fluid and as will change. And so even though we're not going to tie a bow and this is going to leave us with more critical questions at the end of these sessions, that is a part of the process and we want to embrace that. Um, we want to ask for clarification. There are 19 people in this room right now, so we're all likely coming from different spaces or different um, 
comfortability with the conversation and different language that we utilize. So we wanna ask for clarification. We wanna embrace discomfort. Equity work is uncomfortable work. It is literally changing systems. It's not something that we do. It's something that shifts and changes the environment. And so there's inevitably gonna be some discomfort there. This is the not the work for others. This is the work for us. We don't take this to a team and say, you all do this. It's really internal and pers interpersonal work that we must do in order to move towards equity. We want to honor all of the lived experience in this room today and all of the lived experience that will be part compounding part of the work that we do in the future. And so we want to honor that lived experience is expertise and we want to honor both lived expertise and applied learned expertise equally. We want to acknowledge a safe space and a brave space. Talking about deconstructing dominant ideologies feels very safe to me. It might not feel so safe to other people. So there might be some bravery that is uh, required on different parts. And there's some things that make me really uncomfortable that I have to extend some bravery in those conversations as well. One of my absolute favorites is the concept of revisiting welcome. And revisiting welcoming um, is acknowledging that we all process information differently. So I might ask some questions and some folks might have immediate responses. And then some folks right at the end of our session is going, or they might go, that's what I wanted to say. I wanna let you know that at any point in time during this presentation or after, if there's something that you wanna express or ask, the, the revisiting is always going to be welcome. And we wanna acknowledge that sometimes folks process information um, and sit with it and think about it and then come back to it. And we never want anyone to feel like there was a op missed opportunity to say something. We, it's always a great op um, opportunity to bring things back into the conversation. Affirm and give credit to one another. Revoke the expert positioning. A lot of folks in this room probably occupy a space where you have to give people answers pretty quickly. And, um, you know, it's one thing to just allow ourselves to be present and fully engage. We want to listen to understand. We want to be in, um, accountable for the impact of our words and actions, even if our intentions look different. We want to be gentle with ourselves and others, and that includes giving ourselves grace. And we cannot challenge what we cannot acknowledge. So we are here to acknowledge inequities so that we can begin to challenge them. So I ask the folks in this room, which ones stand out to you? Uh, which ones resonate with you? And perhaps if you were here uh, for the previous session, any of these that you saw play out in any conversations you've had throughout the week? I'd love to hear from you. Revisiting welcome. Mm -hmm. Expect lack of closure is a journey. Yeah. Revisiting welcome resonates with me. Me too. That one's a really important one for me. Revoke expert positioning. Mm -hmm. Yep. Affirm and give credit. Yes. Be gentle with ourselves, be gentle with myself and with others. Absolutely. And giving ourselves grace, honoring all experiences and expertise, for sure. Okay. And we know that in this process, people might have um, some difficult questions. Maybe, you know, they're like, this is a space where I really feel like I can ask a question that I don't feel like I've had the opportunity to ask before. Like I said, I always welcome you to put it in the chat to everyone. You can put it in the chat to me privately and I won't associate it with anyone. But we also do have another link um, that Livia is going to include in just a little bit. And that link goes to a site called Padlet. It's an anonymous platform we've set up where people can ask questions. If you wanna ask questions on there too, you're more than welcome to ask a question through Padlet. So we wanna give folks lots of opportunities to really um, engage in the discussion today and ask any questions that you may have. Embrace discomfort, yep. I agree, I agree. Thank you for putting that in the chat, Livia. So just a quick recap of what we talked about in the initial session. Um, and the reason why I'm doing this um, recap is because we want to build on this and have the conversations and the discussions we're um, facilitating today be really informed by a, a critical conversation around equity. And so what I what we shared last time was that we navigate from an equity first framework. A lot of times when I go into spaces, it's about diversifying. They want, how do we diversify um, our organization? 
Okay. Diversification is absolutely essential. There's no shortage of research that shows that when we diversify, it in fact enhances drastically the outcomes for an organization in a very positive and beneficial way. So we know that diversity is so, so important. We also know that inclusion is important and we also know that equity is important. And how it's usually perpetuated is that we'll do, um, we'll diversify the space, we'll work to make sure that those folks feel included and then we'll begin to address equity, particularly once we have those folks in the space. And what we propose is that it's really important to have an equity first framework. And the equity first framework says that in order for those diverse folks to not experience harm, to not be tokenized, to not um, be um, in a system that continues to perpetuate the inequities, we must first begin to examine equity. Equity is often juxtaposed against equality, but the reality of it is that equality is nowhere even near feasible if we don't begin to look at the gaps that exist and persist, the ways that people have been excluded, discriminated against, the way the real barriers that exist for individuals that are equity gaps. Um, and so when we take an equity first framework, we begin to say what in the culture is continuing to ex exclude people? What in the culture has led to the gaps that already exist and how do we begin to resolve those so that this can be a genuinely inclusive place so that when diverse folk come they're able to fully participate and not experience harm in doing so and so that critical reframe of equity first in our framing and being willing to take the difficult leap to examine the gaps is where we kind of lead or begin this conversation any thoughts around the equity first framework? Anything you want to add, Livia, or anything that for the 40% uh, of folks who were here last time, anything that you want to add in terms of that conversation? I think the little, what I heard a little bit from our last week's conversation was uh, also, like you said, the importance of looking at the environment and and, and folks uh, respond to kind of going in the chat box that, yes, what can we do in our work setting? What does that look like? Is it policies? Is it culture? You know, and so what what are some ways to do that is, is some of the questions that came up. So. Um, this is something that um, I think sparked interest, and I hope it does today as well. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Starting with equity does it, it leads us to a strategically wise approach. I agree. Thank you for sharing that. And so we really we we talked we covered a lot of other content as well we talked about we went through some critical terminology um if you hadn't had the opportunity to watch it uh, please go back and have that opportunity to we talked about microaggressions we gave some really tangible examples and what we came back to is what is equity and what does equity look like in terms of culture shift and we pulled this chart that comes from this um model that was developed and this is taken directly from that source. And I think it lays out really beautifully what are some of the pitfalls or the shortcomings that happen when we try with equity, try to um, engage with equity practices. And the first thing that I absolutely see is that people want to do equity. It's a series of tools, it's a five point plan, it's a, um, a task group, which all of those things are important to begin to make a whole systems approach to change. Equity isn't something that we do. It is a, a culture shift. It is a complete re-envisioning of how we're doing things and a critical examination of self. It's not something that can be siloed or put into one unique aspect of like, this is what we're going to do. It must be fully integrated as part of um, the entire identity of the organization. What happens is um, often that there's like a person, a, a charismatic leader, if you will, who will spearhead and move all of that forward. Now that person might occupy a really important role, but then that means that the equity is contingent on that individual. So we don't want, you know, this approach that just says, let's throw this to the wall and see what sticks and have it be led by this really charismatic person. You know, there has to be something sustainable that is woven into the process. 
Yes. Oh my goodness, Nigel. Yes, we are. You will have the slides and the recording. So um, no, you know, I know my folks love to take notes. I'm a note taker myself, but please know you'll have all of this information to come back to. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> you're welcome. And so, you know, the, this is, this is really important. And this, the, I really appreciate about this because then it says, okay, well, what about structural equity? Because sometimes we'll say, you know what, we're going to skip all the people stuff. We're going to make structural changes and everyone else is going to fall in line. And changing a structure without investing in all of the people who work within the structure or support the structure, or buy into it, or have meaningful roles and are stakeholders in it also is not going to lead to sustainable change. Because what's inevitable is that there's going to be an influx of people moving in and out and navigating through the structure. And if they're not able to um, understand or, or um, connect to the structural changes, then it's just a change for change's sake. And we're not actually seeing that equity be implemented through the interpersonal relationships. There's not a one size fit all approach. Um, you know, it can't be something that's symbolically done. We saw a lot of symbolic equity, which was very important, um, but not necessarily something we're seeing concretized. So what would that symbolic or um, superficial equity look like? Well, we, a lot of us made commitments, but then there was no process of accountability that followed after it. And so when we're talking about equity, again, it's not something that we just do. It is something that we're strategic about, that we're thoughtful about, and um, that it really involves a critical shift in the culture. And that's where we see it be the most sustainable and be the most fluid and grow um, in, the, in its greatest capacity. And we'll look at and talk about some examples. And we'll hear from you from some examples that you've heard of um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the work you've done. We covered this, we talked about the different panic zones that people could go into, stretch zones, comfort zones. These are different ways that people might engage with difficult equity-based conversations. Acknowledging that there are times when we feel a lot of discomfort in our body and that might feel like a panic zone. That's like you're in a situation you're like, what is going on? And we might utilize the opportunity to deflect or to get out of that situation. When it comes to equity, that's the moment where we really tune in and anchor ourselves and say, what about this conversation makes me so uncomfortable? Acknowledging that we can go in and out of these zones at any any point in time the comfort zone is that space where maybe we're in it and we're like I this is this is interesting and we're really relaxed about it or perhaps the comfort zone is um the space where we feel like we have to speak for our group and we really just want to take a step back there's appropriate times to be in the comfort zone there are appropriate times to be in the stretch zone I think this one's marked as the most ideal people are engaged there and learning, they're anxious about their learning excitement. Um, and there's times and places where the stretch zones is a good place to be in. And there's also times and spaces where the panic zone is a good place to be in as well. Where we can say something about this conversation is making me really uncomfortable. Maybe it's a cue that there's something inequitable happening here. Or maybe this is a space where I typically can exercise my privilege by removing myself from the situation. And how many times do I continuously repeatedly utilize that panic zone as an opportunity to escape equity-based conversations where I could really be learning more about where it is that I could grow from and what work I could do to be best prepared to lead equity-centered conversations, lead equity-centered change. So the panic zone also plays a really critical role. And I think the misconception is often, how do we get out of it? And again, we can go in and out of these zones at any point in time. But I do have some questions for you that we're going to kind of facilitate through. When you think about equity or thinking about the conversation we had last week, if you had the chance to watch it, you know, what are your stretch zone goals? What are the goals that you have um, to stretch your level of comfort when it comes to equity conversations? And feel welcome to come off of a mute as well if you prefer to speak over type. Listen more than I talk. Yeah. I appreciate that. 
that's a and that's a whole process too because a lot of times we misconstrue listening as just like hearing people but I think what you're really capturing is that listening also means the ability to suspend our very natural and probably innate um urge to formulate response and having the ability to say like I might miss the opportunity to say something back in return because I'm actually so fully engaged in listening is a very unique skill set I appreciate that utilizing the panic zone to escape equity conversations was the zone I was in so my stretch goal was to stay in the conversation and determine what action I could take that felt safe in my body yeah talking to my white family in a way that supports a learning environment instead of them shutting down. Yes, right? I tell folks all the time, we don't wanna have the, the family meal interrupted and everyone leaves upset. We wanna be able to facilitate the conversation, develop the skills for ourselves to facilitate the conversation in a way that's going to move you know, it forward. That's going to be productive. That's going to have someone maybe not change their opinion or thought in this one space, but provide the necessary um, critical communication skills for the conversation to continue. Pausing. Yeah. Maybe folks might want to also respond to either of the um, any of the other prompts as well. Which areas do you want to grow in in your equity practice? And what needs to change culturally for there to be movement towards equity? So these questions or these prompts are really talking about three parts, yourself, your practice, and movement towards equity within a, um, an organization. Mm -hmm. Work harder to gain more information and strategies to start having meaningful change within our programs with a stronger focus on what we need to change. Exactly. And that's that. You're right. That's equity, right? Livia, you have any thoughts? For a movement towards equity to happen, I think also some of the conversations uh, that you, uh, the um, best practices, I'm, I'm sorry, the pitfalls that you mentioned, you know, is important that it isn't just with a champion, right? And so that we really look at, you know, how can we mobilize our staff or our colleagues or, you know, our community in order to, to, to have movement. Um, and so that gets to also how do you, you know, manage change? And part of that is, is creating a sense of urgency around this. And we'll cover that a little bit later too. You know, how can we really uh, look at data? How can we look at uh, lived narrative? How can we look at our own lives and say, this is urgent and this is why. And so mm -hmm. being able to support those conversations within your organization is so important as, as, as part of changing the culture. Absolutely. And so when thinking about our stretch, our personal stretch goals, um, what areas do we want to change and grow in our own equity best practices and what's going on within our organizations? A critical component of that is being able to know when to respond. Yes. Aaron, really great example of um, equity work as well. The language and guidelines, yeah, the things that are stated and emphasis on the process, it's really important. And so when we talk, when we're recognizing, you know, what are the different things that come up for us when getting ready to do this work? There's the pitfalls around in, uh, equity and a lot of those are structural, but then there's also some of the pitfalls or the short, you know, the, the barriers that come up for ourselves. And this is when we find ourselves not able to, not willing to, not knowing how to, not feeling comfortable to, um, feeling concerns around, all types of things that stop us from actually engaging. And these, this list comes from the work on racial anxiety. And it talks about the anxiousness symptoms that can show up in a person's body when they're having a conversation about, say, race or racism. 
But we also acknowledge that these are things for things that are happening within one's bodies that can cue us that something inequitable is happening and that we need to engage. So if you were here last time and you shared what your cues are, we would love for you to put them back in the chat. And if you're engaging with us in this conversation for the first time, I want you to kind of think about a situation that you've been in where you're like, ooh, something's not good, not going well in this conversation and what what you physically feel in your body you know does your facial expression change do you begin to shift eye contact does your tone get louder or softer do you begin to physically distance yourself do you begin to fear or worry that people are going to see you in a particular light or stereotype you do you start to minimize or make jokes make comedy um do you start to shut down intellectualize do you get numb feel a numbness a disbelief do you feel guilty experience silencing maybe you get super polite maybe you display disgust oh, i can't believe you just said that oh, i can't believe i just said that <laughs> you know what are the cues that happen for you in uncomfortable conversations and a lot of times people, and please put them in the chat. Um, a lot of times people say, okay, well, these must be things that we should be trying to move away from. <laughs> and um, what I want us to realize is that not moving away from it, but recognizing when we literally clutch our pearls or like go like this, something inequitable has happened. How do I then pivot that to begin to address some change? How do I begin to turn that Q1 to say, hmm, what feels comfortable and what feels realistic in my body as a way to advocate in this moment? Someone comes to you and they say, you know, this form that we're using within our organization is harmful. And you feel that maybe you, in that situation, you feel that stomach like, oh, we need to do something. How do you know when something needs to change and how do you change that sensation in your body to something that begins to promote action. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna take the first two prompts, the two, first two sets of thought prompts. We're gonna give folks a little bit of time to process it through in some smaller groups. So when you're in the groups, I'll put this, the cues or the prompts back up on the screen, but I want you to think about what is your cue how do you activate from, um, I'll set them up, thank you. Um, how do you activate from experiencing um, your cue to authentic action, right? And what in the, maybe think of an example from the past that you can assess to enhance your response pattern. And so just to put a little bit of clarification around that. Um, oh. Just to put a little bit of clarification around that, what I'm hoping that folks will do is to say, like, I've been in a situation, maybe you use something, you know, de-identified but specific from your organization to think through what would you have liked to have known how to respond? What would you have liked to know in that moment? What were the questions that you had after that situation about how to respond or what to do that a conversation today could really support with? So I want us to get tangible. I want us to really think about this. We've been in situations where we've identified inequities. And so with the first two prompts, I'll put them back up on the screen. I want you to really think tangibly about a situation and what critical questions or what was your cue or what you could have done differently to engage with that, um, with what was happening from an equity standpoint. Okay. So I'm gonna momentarily pause there. And we're gonna keep the groups pretty small because we're only gonna spend about five minutes or so in the groups. And so I want to give everyone an opportunity to share. So I'm gonna um, keep the groups pretty small, okay? And I'm going to Okay. We'll be back in just about five minutes. And Ingrid, you can just and Livia just ignore the invite.
All right, we're just waiting for a couple more folk. There they go. <laughs> Amazing. All right, so I only have one rule when it comes to coming back from breakout rooms, and that's that you don't uh, say Livia share. <laughs> say Livia share something dynamic. I'm like, well, y'all, let me tell you what Livia just said. Okay, if anyone's going to share something, we just welcome um, folks to ask other folks if it's okay to share their story with the larger group. But what are some questions or thoughts that came up um, from your group conversations? Either themes or questions that came up. From myself and Alicia, um, we were talking about the cue, the cues, and we spoke about the pause, as I call it, mm -hmm. to ensure that what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling is not misinterpreted by myself. And Alicia agrees that. She, there is um, an activity and an action around pausing, one, to take a breath, and two, to re reaffirm by asking, what did you mean by what you just said? And what did you mean by what you just done? So that <clears throat> it gives the person or the, <clears throat> the, um, the people around you an, a chance to confirm and maybe correct what they have said or what they have done. If you still feel that it's something that you need to take um, and it's cueing you to, to, to respond negatively, now, I don't want to take up too much time, but the perception that I get is that I don't always, and she agrees with me, we don't always want to be the ones that have it's incumbent upon to pause, to be patient, to be teaching. And that's what I find as a Black male is that I feel like it's always my responsibility to hear and be patient, to, to educate. And, and sometimes it, it wears you down to the point where mm -hmm. the cueing and the patient and the pausing doesn't work. I've, I've gotten better at it. Yeah. That's what yep. we discussed, yeah. That's that allostatic load, that weathering we talked about last time. It is, there is physiological reaction that comes with engaging in equity conversation while being in tune with our body is so critically important. Uh, so I really appreciate that perspective. That pause is important. And sometimes in that pause, where how do we, uh, particularly for folks who are not always experiencing the systemic and structural marginalization, where is that to check in and say, what did you mean by that? Or I'm not sure I understand or, um, you know, Ashley, I, I know that we're all here to reduce harm. That kind of landed like this for me. Did you, how did you intend to say it? And can you clarify? And giving people opportunity to acknowledge any harm that was done. Okay. And if there are other thoughts, we would love to hear them as well. So I love that everyone's talking about pausing and, and being present. And what does that then look like in an organizational level when we're talking about creating organizational change? It's the change and shifting that's happening in the individuals. And then it's also the structural change. And Livia is going to take us through a real brief summary of what we talked about in terms of Cotter's A Steps transformation. But what I want you to think about while she's going through this is what does that pause look like? Um, in an organization and how does that pause assist with making urgent change right because a lot of times we associate pauses with stagnancy or not doing anything but that pause can also be a really trigger a critical point to move forward with urgency and i want to see if we can begin to make that parallel or make those connections um, as we process through Thank you. So John Carter you know, talked a lot about, you know, what makes transformation efforts fail and what makes them successful. And so through his research, uh, he identified these eight steps to transformation. And if you look at applying racial equity work, how to become an anti-racist, how to do that within your 
community or your agency, these eight steps in a way can, can overlay or the racial equity strategies can overlay these kind of eight steps. And so he talks about the, what I mentioned earlier, this, this sense of urgency. How do you create it so that it isn't something that is, uh, okay, we'll get to it, we'll put it on our strategic plan for next year, right? How, you know, or So how do you create that sense of urgency that this is something that has to uh, be focused on now that you have to take action around now or in to start making uh you know whatever steps it is but that you don't shelf it you know and and, and that can that can be a lot of different ways to create that sense of urgency and it could be you know the we've heard a lot from other providers that the impact for example on uh, employees uh, from communities of color, you know, the, the urgency to support their well being, you know, it's not something we can wait with, for example, till next year, right? And so, how do we create that sense of urgency? What does it take? And it can take many forms. And then, this idea about building a guiding coalition, it can be two or it could be 200, right? Is that who is it that also is impacted, who has resources, who is has, uh, you know, wisdom around, you know, can this work? Uh, how do you build in a guiding coalition? And there's a lot of nuts and bolts and how do you support a group of people to become a team? And we won't get into that today, but how you know, building that is really important. And part of that, of course, is to set the strategic vision. And again, you know, it has to be strategic in order to meet the urgency of the moment, right? And how do you really look at having initiatives that branch out from that vision so that the vision is always a North Star, it's always something that inspires people to propel forward. How do you then broaden you, yourself from the guiding coalition to enlisting others? Because you want to have as many people as possible because you're trying to change the culture or you're trying to really you know, change something or transform something in the community or your program. And then by, you know, we always focus on action a lot, but we also want to look at what does it take to remove barriers? Are there some specific barriers that you can take as a first step that will all of a sudden open some floodgates to allow all kinds of action rather than starting with the action first? You know, how can you remove barriers? And then, of course, you always want to look at generating short term wins. You want to focus on how do I sustain acceleration? How do, does it not get stagnant? And who can really focus on that? Who are the best folks to do that? And then how do you institutionalize it? So he talks you know, about this. There's a lot of articles around it, um, but that's part of what we covered last time. And then if you go to the next slide. He, some of the work, and it's not just John Carter, but I like this as a cheat sheet. Basically, you know, if you look at them saying, okay, I, I think about the eight steps, what else, what, what else are the ingredients to do that? And this is like a nice cheat sheet. So if you see at the bottom, you need vision, you need skills, you need incentives, you need resources, and you need an action plan in order to have real change. You know, as, as those, are, those are kind of the big buckets that you need. And without one of, or any one of these, then you can see that the result is either confusion, anxiety, gradual change, frustration, or false starts. It's not that you can't get somewhere, but be to be you know really have successful change that is urgent, that that, that allows urgency. You want all the ingredients. So if you then if you go to the next slide, um, so if you think about what we just covered, and I'd love to hear from you uh, either by raising your hand or in the in the chat box, you know. If you think about a change uh, process you've been part of or you're about to embark on, if you look at those uh, ingredients, which ingredients do you have or does your organization not have? Or what are some that you might be merging in and which are you flourishing in? And you can answer any one of them just to kind of think about those ingredients. Hi, this is Rhonda Layton Jones. Um, Hi. I, I work for the Department of Mental Health, and it started with a vision. <laughs> and then they, they wind up with a correlation, and then they formed a strategy, and they enlisted others, and then it fell flat. It all the planning and people involved and, and getting together. And then I don't, it, it seemed to have disappeared. 
what I found out is the person that who initiated it is retiring for their health and <laughs> stated making change in a system um, was was a little too hard for them. And so they're leaving June 1st. And with that, I believe every stepping stone that we did move forward with is now buried in, in the uh, trash pile somewhere. It's hard to change systems. And without someone willing to and able to go through the whole process, especially with such a large system, I found it to have been very difficult. <clears throat> and so me, myself, I try to change individuals <laughs> just by what the guy said, asking questions, trying to have them think about why they made a decision or why they think that. And then in the, in the group, uh, why was was said to make people defensive. So then it was said, I would ask what makes you do that? What makes you think that or what happened instead of the why? And I, I find that I just, me, in order to try to have people open-minded, especially in, in a system that is geared for clients to never recover or or get better to widen their frame and what I call it's called their worldview to open their worldview of what they're looking at or attending to and and give it thought mm -hmm. with any action that we we take that involves another human being and so that's what I ran up against mm -hmm. in the years that I've been on this earth. So I keep trying, though. It's a fantastic example. You're 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 bringing in in that example so many uh, you know so many elements that are either that were started or that were missing. So you had some and others were missing, right? And as Ashley points out in the in the in the in the chat. It is, uh, you know, one of the pitfalls is we we don't want to have one person kind of driving this or the champion. Yes, it's great to have that and have a guiding coalition so that, you know, that have the resources, that, that have the incentives, that have the skills to develop the action plan, right? And to uh, to come about with the change. You're right. It can't all be on, on one one person. Um, um, so it's 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 sounds like you um you certainly tried within your system, but we also know, of course, that the systems um, is is not easy to change, right? Big, big, big systems. Um, yes. So I just want to acknowledge what you said. It was such a good example. And I wish I could reach right through the screen and say, hey, let me help you. I have some ideas, Rhonda. <laughs> I know. Eh? <laughs> well, and I love what uh, Rebecca puts in the chat too, right? You can have the organization and the skills and um, the people who are, you know, interested in working in it and leading it, right? Um, the urgency of it. I love the fact that you tap into urgency, um, Rebecca, because this is what we're talking about. This is where that pause begins to connect. This is where that pause begins to connect because when we say urgency, you know, you're, what you're capturing here is that urgency is not just a matter of doing something. Urgency is about getting the right people invested, the right people involved, the right incentives necessary to make it sustainable. And that is a critical part of urgency, not just trying something to say that we did it, not just doing something so that we can feel good about ourselves. We collected a survey and, you know, we got data. That's not going to make sustainable change. So I really love that you are being intentional and thoughtful about it and saying this isn't just up to me this is also about recognizing that the systems has to begin to change so that people recognize that they are necessary they are also a necessary ingredients for that change to occur alicia hi i'm driving so i i'm able to speak just can't be on camera but i was just wanted to share um, an experience in regards to the systems change and uh, uh, how taking it from an individual to 
the system to the organizational awareness has really been a challenge. And it, it really has made me feel like if I'm if I'm about this, then I just have to step out on faith and you know go ahead and just hope for the best outcome. So we had a, a project where uh, the community was called, and this was this was what the, the mission was. The community was called organizations and individuals in order to reduce the stigma surrounding children and families. Uh, in regards to mental health. And so we had these focus groups, which I thought was great because it brought uh, individuals as well as organizations together. And uh, they were actual work groups to come up with some themes associated about change. And uh, the people spoke, they spoke loud. We walked away with a great plan uh, that the people developed that was part of this group. And so I'm ready to move those initiatives forward. And administration says, well, we don't like the words. We don't like the wording. How can we make this more of a policy initiative? Uh, how, how can we manipulate the language? And I'm like, hmm. The people, this is what the people say, you know, the, what is it? So pretty much they took the information, took it up to the higher ups who uh, do not represent the people, I'll just say that. And um, they, they thought that it was not sufficient. It wasn't, you know, what they wanted to the language just was not and the language was appropriate it just wasn't as elevated enough or um, educational enough or you know those big beautiful words uh, mm -hmm. that educated people would put in in dissertations and all that and so my my thing was okay i can i'm in the middle you know, I work for the organization, but then I represent the people. And I just had to, you know, realize how it was affecting me because it, it made it seem like some um, microaggression on a macro level. Mm -hmm. And you all are discounting what the people say because the people aren't as educated or you think enlightened, but enlightened, as enlightened as you are. But these, these are people that have lived experience in regards to their, you know, um, mental health and mental health awareness. So, I, I, again, I just have to focus in on my body, focus in on, you know, to what level I'm going to advocate for, for the people. And then even if that means just let me just slow this process all the way down, because I'm not going to go back to the community and tell them well your words or your suggestions weren't approved by the higher ups i felt that that was a total internal conflict and it really made me look at transformational leadership how can i do this while mm -hmm. preserving both what the people said the integrity of what the people said as well as honor the higher ups so I just I just slowed that mug all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> you. Like, wow. you know, it, so. needed, it needed to be slowed all the way down because that is a very common defense mechanism that we see wanting to use this type of language that um, is very generalized or maybe even incomprehensible to the communities that we're intending to serve. But one thing that we know for sure is that people who have experienced systemic and marginalization are much more likely to feel included when language is used that feels very close in proximity to them. If there's someone experiencing transphobia, if there's someone experiencing anti-Black racism, if there's someone experiencing anti-Asian hate, saying that is what's going to make that person who experienced systemic and structural marginalization know that the critical aspects of that are being um, process and thoughtfully and intentionally address rather than the diversity and inclusion of all people. Yeah. Well, thank you all. We, we are actually, I think, at getting towards the end of our time together. 
Um, we had a few more slides, but we will put them in to send out. Uh, I want to make sure we are going just till till top of the hour today, correct? Yes, mm -hmm. thank you so much for this robust conversation. I'm really glad that we were able to do this and the breakout sessions were seem to be really well a, a part of this as well. So I'm glad that you included that. Thank you. And so oh. as we um, bring it to a close, we really want to encourage the conversation to continue thinking about what could differential change initiatives look like, how do we respond to change fatigue, and as we discussed earlier, there's always the um, revisiting welcome, so if this sparked more questions for you, we welcome you to reach out, we welcome you to continue to connect uh, so that we can be supportive. And Ingrid, I know you have a few slides in closing. Yeah, just some closing thoughts. Thanks again for joining today's webinar. We hope to see you at one of our upcoming sessions. Please also make plans to join our diversity talks as well. Uh, as shared, our funding comes from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which requires us to evaluate our services. Attendees who provided their email address will receive this survey 24 hours after the close of today's event. For more information, contact the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. Please also stay posted to our website, which is listed on the slide or links to the video presentation and handouts. For questions about our REACH learning community, please contact us as shown on screen shortly. <laughs> Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone.